Good morning, good evening, uh, you know, wherever you guys are. Uh, welcome to the, let's start the presentation, Bob. Le welcome to the GMI Zener versus Isolated Barriers webinar. Uh, we have collected several questions uh, and we will answer those. It is not the first time we run this webinar, uh, but it's the first time I'm running the webinar with Bob. So let me do one thing here. Give me one second, guys. All right, let me request control of the presentation bar for a few seconds, for a few slides. Do I have it? Okay. So before I start, let me introduce my guest, Bob Johnson. Uh, Bob has over 30 years of experience in the EX world and is a CompEx instructor and an instructor for the, for the ICEX CompEx scheme. He's an inspector and a member of the US UL STP committee, which means he's you know, very qualified to be here with us today discussing Zina barrier or isolated barriers. I will only take a few moments of your time to introduce GMI, who we are, what we do, and why we do it. So GM International is a safety company which manufacture safety interfaces and intrinsically safe interfaces. So for all automation packages, from DCS to SCADA, in every industrial sector, from oil and gas to food and beverage. We have over 40 years of experience and we are very proud of manufacturing 100% our product here in Italy, in our headquarters near Milano. However, we are a global player with presence around the globe. Let me, uh, we, as I said, safety is what we manufacture. So our motto is 100% customer satisfaction while reducing the impact in our world for better, safer product, which reduce the risk for the environment and the people. I hope I didn't sound too uh, mechanical on that, but it is what we do. We do for living, we make safety product. We've been making it for many years in Italy. We have full certification, we do full testing. We are a C3 certified company. And these are the products we manufacture from IS barrier, safety relays, isolators, power supplies, multiplexers. We have termination board, custom termination board to most of the system out there. Hard multiplexers, we have SPD or surge protector device. We make loop indicators and we have a division which provide functional safety training and services. And now soon, in collaboration with Bob, we will run an EX division, running training and services in the EX world. As I said, a global company. So we have presence throughout the globe with our subsidiaries, many distributors. We run many courses throughout the year. Now, during this COVID period, we had to stop our live courses presently. We, last year we did 18 courses. This year we're doing many webinars. Hopefully, we are talking to this morning with Tino, we will run some courses in October. Let's see what happens. We have thousands of installations around the globe. This is some of our customers. We interface system vendors from ABB to Yokogawa. We have done projects with most of the EPCs and many OEMs such as Schlumberger, GE, Siemens. And of course, we are in the ABL of many oil and gas companies and chemical companies around the globe. Oh, here we are. I made it very short this time. I'm getting used to it, Bob. <laughs> so, uh, no uh, before I give it over, Bob, let me uh, mention that we have, as I already mentioned, we have done, uh, let me see, how do I? give up remote control. So now you're in charge, Bob. So we have taken some of your questions, put them in a separate presentation. We answer them at the end of the presentation, but we will leave plenty of time for you guys to make your own question, live question. There's a question and answer box there. You just go in there and type your question and then we'll try to get to it, okay? Okay, so let's begin then. All right. Well, thank you, Paolo. I appreciate that and uh, welcome. 
So let's just talk a little bit before we talk specifically about intrinsic safety and uh, either Zener barriers or galvanically isolated barriers. We want to define an explosive atmosphere. And so what we, what we see are basically the triangle. That's the one that you've all seen, I'm sure, in some way, shape, or form. But a hazardous area in which we're talking about is a combination of flammable substances, could be gases, could be dusts, uh, could be fibers or flyings. We have to have oxygen or air, and then we have to have a source of ignition. Um, again, given that oxygen is always present, the only way to avoid the ignitions is to control the ignition source caused by the electrical apparatus. Now, there are some protection concepts, such as, for example, oil immersion, where we're actually removing oxygen. Um, so that is actually uh, not necessarily true, but generally speaking, in, in most of our EX world, we're talking about removing, in effect, uh, some sort of gas, vapor, or what have you. You are correct, Bob. There is a way to, you know, that statement is partially correct. Partially correct, right, right. So some of the main concepts of protection uh, that we see down at the below, we see things like EXP, EXO, EXM, EXE, e, uh, EXD, and then of course EXI. Um, the principles are basically, they kind of fall into one of three areas, either segregation, uh, where we have encapsulation, oil immersion, pressurization, where we're taking one or more of those legs of the triangle and we're removing it in some way, shape, or form. Containment, where we assume that we're going to have all three legs of that triangle, well, we're going to contain it within a flame-proof enclosure. And then, of course, there's prevention, which uh, increased safety and intrinsic safety pretty much fall into. So, Remember that intrinsic, intrinsically safe, the concept is that we're preventing some, something here. And in this case, we're preventing an ignition capable uh, source, such as an arc or a spark. Now, talking a little bit about intrinsic safety, just on some of the fundamentals. Um, it is one of the most flexible and cost effective solutions, and it is recognized worldwide. Pretty much, um, again, I'm located here in the United States. We've recognized intrinsic safety for many years now. Um, within the National Electric Code here in the United States, our installations for intrinsic safety are all really referenced within Article 504 of the National Electric Code. Uh, the 500 series, if you will, from the NEC is where we talk about a lot of protection concepts for both class division and class and zone, but Article 504 is really where you would want to focus your attention on intrinsic safety. Uh, based upon the directive, a device must be connected between the power source and the field device to make the system safe. Uh, we typically call these items, we know them as intrinsically safe barriers or just barriers. Sometimes we call these associated apparatus as well. So down on your drawing there, you see you have your control room where maybe your instrumentation is located, uh, your controllers, if you will. You'll have your associated apparatus, which are your barriers, your interconnecting cables, and then you have, in effect, either simple apparatus or intrinsically safe apparatus located in the hazardous area. So the basic principle, again, it's prevention. The characteristics are it's low power. Uh, generally speaking, we're talking about one watt of power or less. Um, we, you know, every now and then I'll get questions from people that ask to maybe do a motor intrinsically safe or something else that's generally uh, a more high power type application. Uh, you really can't do it because the ignition curves, again, we're trying to prevent any ignition from taking place. We're keeping it below the ignition curves of the various gases and vapors. So it really lends itself to low power applications. Uh, we deal with what are called safety factors. Uh, these are basically the, uh, well, safety factors, if you will. Yeah. So every gas has a partic particular minimum ignition energy. And we build in these safety factors in the entire loop, if you will. Yeah, there are some requirements for isolation. By 1.5. Yes, yes. We have isolation distances that are required, and we talked about this with some of the, uh, one of our previous webinars about maintaining at least a 50 millimeter distance between IS and non-IS, and of course, the need of a barrier. 
for that system integrity. So the applications are typically electronic and instrumentation devices. Again, low energy type devices, four to 20 milliamp type signaling products, uh, could be switching devices. All different kinds of signaling products generally can be made IS in many cases. So our safety loop, um, we use this term, people use the term intrinsic safety loop. Sometimes you'll hear the term descriptive system document. Uh, that's pretty much one and the same, but our, our intrinsic safety loop is basically the combination of all the information that we talked about on the previous slide, where we combine the information on the simple apparatus, the cable, the associated apparatus, and the instrumentation. So that's our intrinsic safety loop. One of the requirements that you will find pretty much anywhere in the world, no matter where you do intrinsic safety, uh, the regulations do require an intrinsic safety loop. So when we talk about inspections and various other things, when we come in after the fact, one of the first things I'll ask for when I'm, I'm actually doing an inspection on intrinsic safety is I'll ask for, can you provide your DSD or your intrinsic safety loop so we can check and make sure that what actually is there matches up to our drawing. Yeah, what we're trying to say, I think with this slide, Bob, is that uh, you know, it's not sufficient just to say, I have a barrier and that's it. No, no, I need integrity of a complete loop. Absolutely. I believe there is a question we will answer that later. Just okay. on this. Okay, next. Okay. So the associated apparatus, there are really two types. Uh, Zener barriers or barriers. Uh, when people talk about barriers and they just say a barrier, a lot of people just automatically assume we're talking about barriers, but sometimes people will use the term interchangeably between Zener and isolated barriers, but uh, they're both considered associated apparatus. So Zener barriers are basically passive devices that use Zener diodes to divert that fault current to ground. Our isolated barriers, what we call isolators, they are active instruments that use a safety isolation component such as a transformer to keep the fault energy to pass from a safe to a hazardous location. The original technology on intrinsic safety was based upon the Zener barrier concept. So when we go back way in time, when Paolo was a very little boy, uh, before, that. before that actually, <laughs> uh, Zener barriers were the technology that basically everybody grew up on. Isolated barriers uh, have come about fairly recently, within the last 20, 30 uh, years or so. Yeah, it's been around. Yeah. In, in the beginning, at the beginning of the isolator the market that was uh, in the late 70s. Yeah. The beginning, of the 80s with, you know, beginning of the 80s when they developed. And they were, you know, very different from what we see today. Right. Functionalities remain similar. Right. They were bigger, more expensive. No doubt, no doubt. So differences amongst the most widely used protection uh, methods. Well, intrinsic safety, certainly it's very safe. There is a lot of flexibility. Uh, installation cost, you could say, mm, okay, there's a little bit more maintenance. We're trying to compare to explosion proof as, uh, you know, base, uh, as a base, uh, as a base, I, I believe, you know, and looking at yeah. uh, because it today is still, especially where you live, Bob, it's still a prevalent method of protection as frozen proof. Correct, correct. And, and certainly from a safety and flexibility standpoint, intrinsic safety has some big advantages uh, over explosion proof. And certainly from an installation cost, it, it does make it uh, simpler um, in many cases, but the concept of explosion proof is certainly much more well known here in the United States uh, and of course, in the international community, we call explosion proof, flame proof, which are, which are basically the same concepts. And purging and pressurizing is again, another concept uh, of the protection concepts out there. But again, intrinsic safety doesn't lend itself to every application, uh, but certainly for instrumentation circuits, it, it certainly, certainly makes sense. Oh, so it looks like we have a poll here. Let me try to bring this up. It's an easy poll, guys, you cannot get it wrong. Let me launch this poll. So what is the basic protection principle of intrinsic safety? We saw isolation, we saw mitigation, we saw segregation, we saw prevention and containment. 
All right, see the answers are coming in. All right, let's give it a few more seconds. It's a tricky answer because one of these um, doesn't, it's not a, a principle of protection, but okay, let me go like that. We have enough, enough answer and we'll share the result. So most of you got it right. It is revenge. Right, Bob? That is correct, right. Isolation per se is not a method of uh, protection. We have isolated barriers, but we also have zero barriers, which do not provide isolation. What? Oh. What did I do? That's okay. I just closed ah. it. Okay. Should be gone. All right, okay, we can let's move on. Okay, so here's the principle for a zina barrier. Bob, why don't you explain this to us? Okay. So, so basically what we're looking at here is somewhat of a cross section of a zener barrier. Um, and you more or less have uh, a couple a couple similar components. And this is true for every manufacturer that will make a zener barrier type product. Um, we'll, have a, we'll have some sort of fuse that you located over here. We have a current limiting resistor located. And then we also have voltage limiting zener diodes. So, we basically have these three components that are located inside of our associated apparatus zener barrier. So what happens when we have a fault current? Um, if all of a sudden that voltage starts going up too high, our zener diodes will start to open up. What will happen is that any of that excess voltage should be going to a system ground. And this ground must have one ohm of resistance or less. Now this is different your system ground down over here is different than the standard dirty earth that we would normally find in our process facility. So we do need to have a dedicated system ground and this is exactly what would happen. So at no time over on the left hand side we should have a situation where there's too much energy transmitted into the hazardous location. Obviously yeah, Oh, go ahead. I'm no, sorry. sorry, Bob. Let me mention that these three components, they're very simple. You know, you have zener diode, resistor fuse. Because they're called impalable safety components, they are potted in resin, so you cannot mess with them. So this is one of the limits of the zener barrier. So this fuse is inside a resin, encapsulated resin, so it cannot be replaced. Correct. So an isolated barrier, if you look at it, it's a very similar concept uh, we still have our current limiting resistor. We have our voltage limiting zener diodes. We have our fuse. And then we also now have a safety transformer. So what we have in a situation like this is that if we have a fault condition, what will actually happen, it'll come into one leg of the transformer and it'll stay into the non-hazardous area. So that safety transformer, and Paulo, you explained a little bit about that. Uh, why don't you explain a little bit about what goes into a safety transformer? A safety transformer, you know, is it's called again. It's one of those uh, listed components uh, in uh, IS paper. It's called an infallible component, meaning that it cannot fail. But of course, it can fail, but it can only fail open. So it is designed that the transformer, in worst case scenario, you apply the maximum voltage possible on the primary, 250 volt, for example. You short all the secondaries, some transformer more than one because you can have power plus you can have 420, uh, you can have heart. So you short in complete transformer on one side and you wait and it starts getting very hot. Imagine if you see those, you know, low cost uh, charger for your phone, how hot they get and sometimes they melt down, right? This transformer right. is tested like this, it's designed to, in worst case scenario, to get hot. And when it gets hot, suppose it reaches a temperature of 300 degrees. Well, you have to build it with a safety factor 1.5. So you build it for 450 degrees. So the isolating material used has to be able to withstand with a greater margin of error, the maximum temperature reach. Therefore, the transformer itself cannot melt. It cannot break down. It might open, the wires can open, you lose your signal, but you can never transfer more energy than you intended to. I hope Thank that you. was clear Thank enough. That was very clear. Well, and, and this is one of the questions that people will ask if you, if you think about it, uh, the cost differential between a Zener barrier and an isolated barrier. 
Well, we see that a Zener barrier doesn't have that safety transformer, right? And of course, we do have that with an isolated barrier. So generally, there is some cost. There is some cost difference, but later we'll discuss. But not as much as you think, because right. in the isolated barrier, because we have isolation, when we look at the safety side of the barrier, so the diode and the resistor, we're looking at much smaller voltage than the maximum potential voltage you're working with. Therefore, you're looking for smaller components, less uh, less expensive components. The Zener dial used in an uh, isolated barrier are not the same as those used in a Zener barrier, the and they do cost a lot more than one in the Zener barrier. Right. So when we have a fault condition under a Zener barrier, uh, what could potentially happen? <clears throat> Excuse me. So if we do have a fault condition, uh, potentially, I mean, in this particular example, we're showing that we do have a good ground. But if, say for example, that ground was not good or if it was disconnected, we could potentially have a situation where that fault current could go to ground on our dirty earth, right? And we don't want to have a situation like that because it could be above the threshold of the ignition temperature or the ignition curves of the gases and vapors. Uh, conversely, we could also have, <clears throat> excuse me, we could have noise that's generated or we could have a fault that's generated back through the system, back into the barrier itself from earth or some other place. So it's, it's very important that when we do use Zener diode barriers that we need to have a good ground connection. Uh, it's very, very important. If we don't have a good ground connection, then basically whatever we have done in our Zener barrier system, we have pretty much defaulted or uh, we, we don't have any uh, safety yeah. integrity. Yeah, without the ground, the, the diode cannot operate and you are floating and it, it is like not having a barrier. So correct. It defeats it's, the purpose uh, of spending the money. You know, you just <laughs> don't spend the money, it's the same. Right. So on our on our fault condition, again, this is just showing a fault condition on a uh, isolated barrier. Again, notice that we do not require the need for a safety ground with the use of an isolated barrier. So that's one of the big advantages of using an isolated barrier is the fact that we do not require that safety ground. Now, Zener barrier groundings, this, this slide shows a little, bit, uh, a little bit more information. Notice that we have our structural ground, but we also have our safety ground. Notice that generally speaking, uh, it's good common practice to actually have a redundant safety ground because we wanna make sure that we test that safety ground, right? So we might have to go in with a, a meter of some sort and test that ground to make sure that we've got one ohm or, or, or less resistance. But the moment that we've reduced or removed that safety ground, then we've lost our protection for our Zener barriers. So it's very common to have actually a redundant ground for a lot of Zener barrier applications. It's not mandated generally by any of the standards. It's, it's more of a good practice. You will see a lot of clients that will do that and they will require you that if you are doing Zener barriers, uh, they will want you to actually have a, a redundant safety ground in addition to just having a safety ground. So, and again, remember that is different than our structural ground. It's an additional cost there. And of course, additional cost, right. So again, now this kind of goes back to uh, a little bit of what I just talked about before, but if we had a fault condition current from ground from an electric motor, now all of a sudden we're coming back into the barrier at that particular point in time. So now all of a sudden, this is why it's so important to make sure that we keep our IS ground separate from our independent from our structural ground. And, and you know, Bob, you mentioned a couple of times less than one ohm. I, I don't know, but it sounds quite difficult to get less than one ohm in the ground. It, it Especially be, maybe you're out in the desert somewhere. There's no way. <laughs> right. It is. Uh, it can be difficult. So a little bit about some of the differences, and we've we've touched base on this. Um, but what are some of the differences? Obviously, and and one of the big things is obviously on a galvanic there is no safety ground requirements. So therefore, from a maintenance standpoint, uh, certainly uh, in running that extra, extra ground, we don't have to worry about that. The accuracy, 
Uh, lower installation cost. Again, when we talk about total cost of a system, if you will, remember we have to take a look at all of the components, not just the cost of the barriers themselves, but then we also have to talk about what it takes to make this installation safe. And so many times people do forget about the use of our, our dedicated IS earth, how we have to install it, how we have to segregate it, how we have to maintain it, doing all that good stuff. Uh, signal standardizations. And again, it does allow the use of grounded or poorly isolated centers, sensors. On our zeners, remember we have a dedicated safety ground. We do require our routine checks. The field sensor must be isolated. And there is some zener leakage uh, that can influence the accuracy of a zener diode. Uh, again, that's, uh, that, that can happen. Well, now we ask you a very easy question because we talked about this for a little bit. Let's see, but it is a misleading question. So be careful before you answer this one. Read the question correctly. Is a dedicated low resistance ground required in a galvanic healing isolated barrier installation? Uh -huh. I see good answers so far. You guys are paying attention. Excellent. You guys Excellent. are paying attention. That is a good point. <laughs> Okay. By the way, Paolo, do they get a free uh, GMI hat or coffee cup? That's a good point. We are discussing this with our marketing team. We are sending you guys, all of you, all the registrants. We will send you a copy of the presentations. And, uh, you know, you'll have our contacts. You can contact us. Maybe we should also send some gadgets. You know? ah, there you go. All right. I think most of people answer. So, hand poll. And you all are 100% answer correct. Great guys, you've been listening. <laughs> well, done. Okay. well done. Well done. Okay, so we are uh, basically now our closing here. And we run, uh, because we are about half an hour, so exactly what we want it to be. As we said, so let's um, go like this. All right. Then we, we receive a lot of questions during the registration. So we prepare answer to those. And let me share the answer we prepare for them. Let me see if I can do it right. Share. All right, guys. Do you see what I see or not? I see you. If a component system is IS, correct? You see me? Do you see my presentation? I see it. Okay, I see it, but I don't see it. All is I see part of it. Okay, I got it. Now we're here. Well, the first question we got if it is if a component of a system is IS, can the system be considered IS? Basically, what we were discussing before, if a barrier is used, is that sufficient? And how not if not, how to ensure the same? So let's see what we prepare as an answer. We talked about entity concept. Bob, you want to talk about this? What is an entity concept or a system approach? No, no, go ahead. You're, you're, you're doing great. <laughs> I'm looking right. at some of the other but questions. They, you know, basically in the old days and in some places of the world, take Japan, for example, they still use this system approach. So what they do, they take your sensor, they take your wiring, the barrier, and they certify them as a system, as a loop. So in this case, you have a guarantee that they are safe, but only this barrier with this sensor in this distance. Uh, in the, I don't know, long ago, we start using an entity concept, which means for each device, we give a set of parameters and this set of parameters needs to match. And we'll show you in a second. So basically you have your associated apparatus, so the barriers, you have the field, Apparatus, so you have the simple devices such as a thermocouple, RTD, switch, or you have transmitters, valve, LEDs. All those devices which are not simple devices need to be themselves certified. So they will have a set of parameters. Let's see if this is shown in the next slide. Here we go. So they're called entity parameters. So there are associated apparatus parameters. So the barrier ones. Do you see my mouse moving, Bob? I do not. You do not, okay, because I'm moving it on the wrong side. Okay. 
Well, possibly I cannot do it, but it doesn't matter. So you have UM, which is the maximum allowed voltage on the safe area circuit. Then you have the maximum open circuit voltage, short circuit current, the maximum power that the barrier can transfer, the maximum capacitance inductance that the barrier can handle. This seems complicated, but there are a bunch of parameters which are given by the certification agency to the associated barrier, so to the barrier. On the other side, the field device, the field is of the apparatus, have their own sets of parameters. So the maximum voltage that they can be connected to, the maximum current, and the maximum power that can be connected to and remain safe. At the same time, the maximum internal capacitance and inductance. You have these parameters also for the cabling, because the cable themselves can become an energy storing device, so you have capacitance and inductance along the cable. I think we have more answer on the cables. So what you have to do is you have to match the two. So if a barrier says it has a UO of 30 volt and your transmitter has a UE of 30 volt, you're okay because they are the same. So the UO, the, it's very simple. In other terms, the barrier guarantees a maximum power transfer to the hazard. The transmitters is saying, I am safe as long as you don't provide me more of this power. If you are not providing more of that power guaranteed by the barrier, well, then that the loop is safe. Sounds complicated. It is a little bit complicated. That is why you have tools like this is a GMI tool to make this, to make this match. So the parameters are entered in a web or an Excel spreadsheet and they will tell you it's okay or not okay. Am I doing okay, Bob? Doing great. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you want to add something to it. I'm probably there is no, a no, lot no. to talk about, but uh, no no that's uh that's fantastic. There was uh, yeah there was one open question that we did get and I figured we could answer maybe that one right now or so. Yeah why not? You yeah, have, you you have access to it? You see it? Yeah yeah I see it. So uh, the question is, what can you do if you want to power an intrinsically safe portable gas sensor for use in a hazardous area? Very low power is key, and consuming one watt for a barrier will be too high for use. Is there another option? Potentially, yes. Um, what another option could be is, depending on the gas sensor, you, what you may find, many of the sensors that are actually on the marketplace, you'll find that they're not only intrinsic safety, but they may be also rated EXD. Um, so you could find a gas sensor, potentially, that's suitable for a zone one area. Now, remember IS can provide protection into a zone zero as well as zone one and zone two. EXD, as far as an option, a protection op option, is only approved currently for zone one and zone two. So uh, assuming that gas sensor was located in a zone one area, if you wanted to take that sensor, potentially place it inside of a flame proof housing where maybe the head is actually exterior to the housing and whatever powered components of it are located within, a, within its housing, uh, that certainly would be an option. Yeah, there is a lot of instruments nowadays who have double certifications. They are EXD and EXI especially the, what we call three, four wire transmitters like fire and gas detectors or uh, rather radars, uh, which require more power than the bearer can give safely because we have another question, we have prepared an answer later. You know, there are a bunch of you, the bearers is certified for a certain gas group or a certain area. In, and that maximum power allowed in that gas group is defined by standard, not by the bearer. So you cannot go above that. If the transmitter requires more than that, then you cannot make it intrinsically safe. So typically you might have devices which are EXD for the powers, might even be connected to a 220 volt AC, but the output, it's a 420 milliamp to a safety bear. Let's see other questions we got here through the registration process. And you guys, if you need to ask question, please feel free to do so. Use the question and answer box there. Okay. How do IS electronic works? Well, this is an answer that uh, I might be able to give because it's uh, related to manufacturing. It's, you know, keeping in mind that we are manufacturing product, we cannot give you our secrets. 
<laughs> but uh, we can try to answer this question. Um, you know, bear is a very simple concept. We discussed this earlier. You have very few components which are called infallible components. So they are safety components, like a zinc dye, a resistor, a fuse, a transformer, and a few others. So by using this component, testing this component, make sure they are infallible. The standard also defines the type of component you can use. A resistor, you can only use, a, I, I forgot now, you cannot use a carbon film resistor. You have to use a certain type of resistor. You have to use a certain type of fuses and so on. By using the right type of components and keeping distances, clearance, creepage, temperature check in your device, you can make the an IS product. Because the question was, how do, does it work? It's, it's not magic, but it works. Let's say this, let's give this answer, Bob. In our experience, and in fact, in the life of intrinsic safety, since it has been conceived, there was never an accident caused by one of these devices. They never failed. There were many accidents where IS bearer had been installed, but they were not the cause of the accident. I would agree with that. Yeah, I'm not aware of a situation where I know that the, the barrier itself was the potential uh, cause of failure with the system. Uh, yeah. Improperly installed barriers certainly have been yeah. culprits. Uh, there are so many built uh, extra factor of safety in there. You, you saw three diodes in your lift. One diode is sufficient. But by standard, you have to be able to withstand two independent faults and still remain safe. So all the components that a failure will cause a dangerous situation are triplicated. So, you know, the possibility of uh, the very, 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 in fact, they are zero. Apollo, okay, there was, sorry, there go was, ahead. Yeah, there was a question that was asked, and I, I like this question. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, getting the safety parameters from the suppliers uh, is, al is always challenging, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, it's been observed that the manufacturer uh, upgrading their model number, but still old parameters are being used. Yes, this is, uh, this is very much uh, a big issue. Um, manufacturers, if you think about it, um, you go back and you look at all of our smart devices that are being developed, right? Um, we have smart transmitters that it used to be if you contacted a manufacturer, you might have 20 different models that would be dedicated for a particular application. And now by technology, they've got one model that will do all of them, but yet you have to set dip switches or it has to be programmed or, or doing something. And it's, uh, I've seen situations where even the parameters may change with that particular product, depending on how it's programmed. Not only from a situation where the parameters have changed from a previous generation product to a next generation. So it is, uh, that's a really good point. And it's a very important thing to try to get the information based upon the device that you're actually evaluating or using, not a previous generation or not the next generation. Make sure that you're getting the parameters for that device that you're actually using. And that does cause a lot of confusion and heartache and uh, manufacturers do need to do a better job as far as documenting that. Well, you know, we showed you earlier a spreadsheet in, and it's also available on JMI website. When you pull up a model number, automatically picks the correct parameters. Uh, these information are found in the certification. So the, the, the only way is you ask for the certificate of that device and yeah. in there you can find the parameter. Although even then it can be a little tricky because the certification can have many revisions. So you have to scroll down the pages, get to the bottom of it, the latest revision. Sometimes we have this issue, you know, we have a, our ATEC certificate on some of the barriers, 40 pages long. So, you know, you need to get to it. All right, let's see the another question. We have a disadvantage of using a one out of two isolated. Uh, let's see, do I, what was the answer we prepared on this? Oh, the guy was looking for a splitter, I imagine, Bob. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, well, you know, there are uh, advantages and disadvantages. We try to point them out here. But it has not much to do with our uh, discussion today. It's mostly to do with the fact that you have a, when you are using a splitter, 
you have a single point of failure. Correct. And this can create an issue. Let's go to the next question. Vibration probes. All right, we have a solution for vibration probes. Uh, in fact, let me take this point to discuss, you know, isolated battery today are available for many, 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 many applications, if not all the application. Unless, of course, low power application, as we about already discussed. We cannot make a 220 volt motor safe, intrinsically safe. Okay, well, about this question, you have already answered to, I imagine. But I think so. If the sensor element fails to ground, what are the consequences? Can barely use interface to interface ground the sensor? Well, I guess not. This is the same slide as earlier. You wanted to reiterate that, or you guys are okay? No, no. Yeah. Yeah. Basically, you know, the, the idea is that without ground, there is no safety in a zina barrier installation. And the same is true if you have an, an isolated, non-isolated sensor or you fail to ground the sensor. Like in case we had these instances once in a thermocouple. Thermocouple is in a thin casing and the casing, you know, vibration can lead for the thermocouple to land to the case. So you have a grounded thermocouple. Grounded thermocouple is a dangerous situation for a zinc barrier because the fault can be diverted to the ground, to the hazardous area without any limiting resistor or diode. Let's move to the next question. Can I install a zener or an isolated barrier in a classified area alongside a VFT? Bob, what is a VFT? Variable frequency drive. All right, so, well, you know that, and you know better about classified area than I do, so maybe you should answer this question. Well, yeah, well, let's see what the answer is. So, uh, yeah. So installation of an intrinsically safe barrier, uh, well, first off, to back up a little bit, the, the GMI products and, and other products on the market are generally suitable to be installed in a division two or zone two environment uh, without having to place them inside of an explosion proof box or flame proof box or a purge and pressurized system. Uh, however, if we do need to put them in a division one or zone one application, putting the barrier inside a hazardous location, then we do have to use some sort of protection concept such as EXD or EXP. Uh, the question as far as VFD, the big issue with VFDs is harmonics and noise. So really it's very critical. We can certainly use IS. I guess probably the, the most common situation or concern that I would see in using intrinsic safety along uh, variable frequency drives is the harmonics of the noise that's generated from the VFD and how that can interfere with our intrinsically safe signal or circuit, if you will. Well, um, I guess we need to use an isolated uh, device, which can isolate, uh, I, I guess. I mean, I don't well, know much about frequency. And, and we, well, so say for example, if we're running usually variable frequency drive cables, we'll have elaborate shielding to keep that noise from emanating and interfering with all other electrical devices. So it's not uncommon. That's the same thing that we're concerned with, with intrinsic safety based upon inductive currents and, and all that good stuff. So the, the principles still remain the same. Uh, I don't, I'm not aware of a situation where by you must go above and beyond, say a 50 mil segregation of IS and non-IS circuits just because the non-IS circuits are variable frequency drive circuits. Uh, but certainly I'd be very concerned and, and I would want to keep them separate as, as much as possible yeah. if you could possibly do it. But I guess the question also can be asked in general terms, you know, if you need to move the barrier closer to your hazardous location, so in zone one, right. then the, and the barrier by itself is not certified to be in zone one, then you can use another method of protection such as an EXD box Right. cabinet that is rated and for someone. We don't talk about it in this presentation, but one of the issues that is actually part of one of the things that we talk about during the IEC EX COPC training we talk about is that what if we have a scenario, right, in which our cable parameters that we've done our calculations and maybe it says that our maximum length of cable based upon 
capacitance and inductance is 300 meters. But yet my run that I need to go between my associated apparatus and my field device is gonna be 400 meters. What do I do, right? So a solution in that scenario would be shorten the cable. Well, how do we shorten the cable? Well, potentially is by placing the barriers in an area of greater hazards, such as zone one or div one, where we place them inside of a flame or zone box. Two. Or zone two. We, right. did, we had this very, very uh, same application not long ago, and there was 600 meter run, and it was too much because the cable was not one of the best cable in the market. The cable had already been installed. They could not replace it with the lesser or bigger cable with lesser capacitance. So the only way was to move the barrier in zone two, which is not as expensive as putting it in an EXT enclosure because it's already certified for zone two. And, you know, we reduced the distance to 300 meters and that was enough. We had a question here that uh, follow up to the earlier question uh, about uh, if a manufacturer changed the electronic, does he have to recertify? Typically, yes, uh, but it can be tricky. It depends on what you do in the electronics. Uh, there are some components inside a uh, barrier or a device that is certified, which are uh, called, uh, they're listed components, so they are uh, safety components. And this component cannot be touched without a recertification. But if you are changing perhaps the manufacturer on a resistor that is not a safety resistor, you might not have to recertify. You need to revise that you do that in time. So, but the yeah, parameters the are important, need to be given by the manufacturer. They are stated in, in the certificate and that's all we can tell you. Yeah, and, and it's a good, changing the electronics does impact the parameters and uh, but if they update the electronics, does it need to recertify uh, so they could get the right parameters? That's um, that is a good question. They generally, if if you are changing something to where the parameters are going to change, generally speaking, that should be as as Paulo mentioned, it should be something that they've done and had recertified, and they very well might issue. Uh, under the ATEX directive, a notified body would uh, offer a, um, a, a revision. Uh, I can't remember the term exactly what it's used, but you'll pull up the ATEX cert and it might be revision or addendum eight or on the something like that on the certificate. Yeah, for example, if you want to change, uh, we had this request, you know, as a 420 million barrier, which power a transmitter typically has a 28 volt, maximum 28 point something volt, Zina diode, okay, so the, the, the voltage is clamped at 28 volt. We had a special manufacturer who was running more, needed more voltage to the transmitter, so he wanted a 30 volt Zina diode in there. Well, you cannot just go in the production and replace it with a different diode. That will impair your safety, so you have to redo an impact analysis, you have to redo all your calculation, temperature, test, and so on, and recertify. And that is verified by inspectors, uh, we, for example, have several certification from Korea to Japan, US, Europe, Russia, yeah, FM, UL, you know, many, many different certification. They have three, two to four times a year unannounced inspection in the factory floor to verify that the components you're installing are the ones that are, they have approved. So, you know, I, I would never, I don't believe there are manufacturers there, out there with certification that are doing something like that. But you, know, you can only trust the manufacturer. So you know, go to the right manufacturer, to you know, one you can trust. There is another question here that maybe pertain to the same. Um, if you can protect a zone zero sensor with the barrier, for example, for evaluation LR, do you still have to meet the maximum capacity required with minimum spacing regulation within the zone zero attic sensor for group two seeker? Do you understand the question, Bob? I'm not sure. Um, but you can for sure protect a zone zero sensor with the beta. Our beta are certified for zone zero second C, the worst case scenario. Right, yes. But the um, sensor must be certified for that location itself. That is true, unless it's a potential simple device, right? Yeah, like uh, a switch. Right, a switch. But assuming it is a sensor, um, 
and it's 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 got some energy storing that's basically a non-simple type device. The sensor itself would have to be certified for zone zero and it would have to be certified for a 2C gas. The, the, the maximum capacitant requirements, minimum spacing requirements within the zone zero, I believe yeah, you'd, all that. you'd have to still comply with all that. I yeah, yeah, you need, if you want to install a device in a classified area, whatever it's zone zero, zone one, zone two, or div one, div two, it has to be certified for that installation. Then it, if, if it is IS certified, it requires a barrier to operate. And the barrier itself also must be certified for that gas group. It's more easy to, the barrier today, most barriers are certified for uh, zone zero, second C. Sometimes you take, um, you need more power because zone zero, second C is very, very little power. If I remember correctly, it's like micro jobs, you know, very, very little power. Very so, right. you know, sometimes the barrier have double certification, you allow more power in different gas group. But, uh, okay, let's move forward with our presentation on the question and answer. How about line monitoring issue? Any differences? Well, we get this question all the time about line monitoring. We can do line monitoring with the barrier, isolate the barrier. Are there any differences? Uh, I don't know, Bob, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I potentially a Zina barrier might have less of an issue with line monitoring because it is transparently transferring the signal. Uh, yeah. And the line monitoring is, remains within the, you know, your PLC. With the, what we know is an isolated barrier. We have devised, we have created a solution to transfer a line monitoring transparently in the same way as in Zina barrier. Uh, and here we have some example for uh, Namu switches, right. the free switches and so on. We are starting to run out of time, so let's move forward. Are there any differences in the marshalling cabinet wiring layout when using Zener or isolated bear? I don't know, Bob, you are very expert on this. You can answer this question. Well, I mean, basically, really, our wiring, uh, the, the only real major difference is the fact that we have a system ground. Um, and so certainly if, I would say this much, a lot of Zener barriers, what you'll find, they're mounting on DIN rail. And so if we're mounting them on DIN rail, uh, we have to also take into account that that DIN rail is probably going to be tied into the system ground because people will use that. They'll take an earth uh, terminal, tie that in, and that will be the system, that'll be the, excuse me, the clean earth. So from an installation standpoint, really the, the, the main is. thing is, is really revolving around the fact that we have to take into account making sure that that clean earth is separate from our dirty earth, which means it's also isolated from our cabinet. So we might have to use non-metallic insulated standoffs for that DIN rail, uh, as opposed to if we were just using a galvanically isolated barrier, we wouldn't. But the, as far as the wiring methods, there's still the 50 mil segregation uh, you can see in these pictures that you see the use of blue duct, if you will. So we do still require, regardless if it's uh, isolated or Zener, again, that 50 mil segregation between IS and non-IS, that doesn't change. It really just boils down to really the, the grounding. Yeah. All right, great. Let's see next. Well, wow, this I'll let you answer. <laughs> What do all the symbol means in the X marking? I've been working in this environment for, I don't know, 30 years and still don't get it right. So I'll let you answer this question. Okay, so uh, in this case, and I'll, I'll be brief. So our CE, uh, that's, our, uh, that's our marking that it's in compliance to one or more European directives. And by the way, if something has a CE, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's ATEX. So there's many different directives low voltage directive, pressure equipment directive, the ATEX directive. So when we combine the CE with a little hexagon uh, EX, that's telling us that it is in compliance to the ATEX directive. The 0575 number, that's a unique number for every notified body. 
So uh, as an example, if it's uh, say PTB or Syrah, that number will be the same for every product that they are actually certifying. So that number will be unique. So you know the certifying body or notified body. The Roman numeral two, that's telling us that it's equipment group. Um, and that's basically anything above surface or surface and above. So it's not for mining applications. Okay. Under the ATEX directive, we have categories one, two, and three. Um, so category one equates to basically a zone zero or zone 20 application for dust. Uh, in this case, we have a G. We could also have a G or D or both. Uh, G is for gas applications. So basically what we've seen there with the Roman numeral two, the one and the G under the ATEX markings is that it is a surface application. It is a zone zero application involving gases. Then when we look at our marking of our equipment, our EX mark is telling it's exposure protected. The IA is our type of protection. The gas group is Roman numeral two C. And then our T code is T4. Uh, and then we've also included the EPL uh, GA. So GA is basically the IEC's uh, EX equivalent to categories. So where you see one G on the left-hand side under the ATEX directive, that equates to GA. So if the equipment category was 2G, then on the right-hand side, it would actually read out GB, <laughs> okay? So basically, that's that's the markings. Bob, why don't you elaborate a little bit on that T4? So that uh, sometime can, you know, why yeah. what a bear has got to do with T4? So yeah, well, okay. So what this is actually telling us in this case is that that barrier, uh, when installed in the ambient that is should be specified somewhere on that product, and the standard ambient for EX equipment is minus twenty to plus forty. So a T4 is telling us under its highest ambient condition, and let's just assume a plus 40 degrees C, which is the highest that it's rated at, that product will never exceed, in this case, T4 is 135 degrees C. Meaning that at a 40 degrees C ambient, that barrier, when it's fully energized, will never exceed 135 degrees C. So when we're placing products into a hazardous location, a T code is very important because the ignition of gases and vapors can come from obviously arcs, sparks, but also we can have uh, spontaneous ignition based upon temperature. So every gas that you will find out there that are actually uh, flammable will also have a T code that equates to this. So what this is basically telling us is that if we see a T4 on a product, we can use this product in an environment in which the gas is also a T4, or we can use it in gases that are T3, T2, and T1. What this means, however, is that if our requirement is that we have to have a, a, an installation in which we have a gas that has a T5 gas, meaning that it's somewhere between 100 degrees C and below 135 degrees C, we could not use that device. So yeah. it's important to understand the T codes. It doesn't, it, it really doesn't become a big issue with intrinsic safety. It really becomes, generally, it really becomes a big issue with the use of motors or light fittings or transformers for use in hazardous locations because they're generating a lot more heat. Yeah, I remember, yeah, there was a question, one of the webinars about the LED. And right. if LED was a simple device, and we know that it is not, and there's only one reason, because it can get very hot. Because you have all the energy in one little spot, so you need to be verified for temperature. Now to correct you a little, well, not to correct you, but to state something, you know, GMI oh. barrier are rated plus 70 degrees. So when we be before, we yeah, have I, a very, very little narrow band where we can, and this is one of the main problem in certifying these devices. You need to remain cool inside and not to the normal operation under fourth condition to guarantee the T rating and, and it's not easy. And then this yeah. is why the barriers are not as small as they can get because they need right. some dissipating heat. 
and and Paulo, let me defend myself. I wasn't implying that GMI was only no, no, no. minus 20 to plus 40. Here's the important thing to remember that. If a product has an EX mark, but does not have its ambient range marked on its product, then the default is minus 20 to plus 40. Okay, but so you're absolutely correct. Range. Yeah, but it, a manufacturer such as GMI can mark it from minus 40 to plus 70 or whatever that range is. And you will also find, and this is something that confuses people, but you can find multiple temperature codes based upon multiple ambient ratings. So you might have a T4 rating at plus 70, but you might have a T5 rating at plus 50. Because yes. if the ambient is cooler, the equipment therefore doesn't get as hot, therefore you can use it for more application. Okay, great. I think we can exhaust this question. Uh, let's Sorry. try the next one. Uh, all right. Okay, well, I think we can skip this one because we are out of time. In fact, we are into one hour. It's uh, do I have to knock from the topology of IO signal? Really not, because, uh, you know, IS barriers are similar to Zina barriers. Zina barrier, you need to select the proper type based on the maximum voltage, maximum current that you're using. An isolated barrier, you need to use, select the type based on the application for 20, temperature, thermocouple and RTD and so on and so forth. But there are so many different barriers out there. These are some of ours. You have application for every single device that you might come up with. Uh, vibration, uh, load cell, uh, frequency. So let's try to get to some important question before the time's right now. It actually has already run out, but I see you guys are still there so we can go on a little bit more. How important is C rating? Okay, here again, it's a different question, not pertaining to Zener or isolated, but is how important is C rating for IS for a barrier? Well, you know, guys, we do a lot of work in functional safety. We provide training, we have certifications. I believe it is important, so I actually put this together myself. But Bob, you can <laughs> go for it. If you no, want. no, 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 you're good. Uh, I, I, I would just, you know, it's, it, we, we, we current, when we say a bear is certified with a certain C level, we are basically saying we define the failure rate, like failure data for that bear. So we're saying it can meet its safety function within a certain guaranteed range. And it's a very, very small number, the failure rate. For a C3 barrier, you're talking E minus nine. So right. it is a more reliable product, let's say that's, this way. That's the key point that I would want to emphasize is that if I have a choice of buying a product that has a SIL rating that's been independently verified or validated by a third party, then I know that that manufacturer actually has gone to the trouble of looking at and, and having to go through this process of reliability of all of those components that go into it. So I know that you guys, in particular GMI, goes in, in order to get your seal rating. That means that every single component that you're using in a galvanically isolated barrier, you need to know the failure rates. You need to know the reliability. Uh, you, you know, all of that information has to be documented. And it's also important if you think about it, uh, and Paula, you mentioned this before, you're, it's not so simple just to change out a component of one, you know, anytime you want to change a component on an intrinsically safe, you know, a piece of EX equipment, what does that do? Well, not only that, but now when we're talking about functional safety, if we change this resistor or this diode or this capacitor or this little device from manufacture X to manufacture Y, how does that affect our sill rate, right? So the, the important thing is, is that what I'd like to get across to everybody is understand that SIL ratings, are they really needed for an intrinsically safe barrier? Maybe, maybe Especially not. for a product like a barrier, which guarantees the safety of the plant, you know, at the right. end. At the end, it's, it's a good idea, you know, whether or not it's mandated, that's another issue. But here's the key thing. You know that it's been tested, you know the reliability, um, that manufacturer has gone that extra step to do all that stuff. And that's really the important thing from my perspective. 
Let's see. Uh, okay, this is a tricky question that I got in the in our um, registration, and I had to ask my engineers how to answer this one. Isolated barrier require a power source. This increases my power supply need. Correct. You were mentioning earlier, bit, Bob, that it has a transformer. Transformer raises the cost. Does it also raise the power requirement? At first, you think so. Uh, is that all the answer we got from the engineering team? <laughs> <laughs> but in, uh, basically, the answer is not really, because the power is required somewhere. You need to power the field device. You either power it through the isolated barrier or you power it through your power supply through the Zena barrier. But at the same time, the power, power requirements not change. You know, your transmitter requires 15 volt, 25 milliamp, while well, you need to provide that power, whether through an isolated barrier or a Zena barrier. Now, the isolated barrier might have some extra volt, you know, some extra power requirement because it has a few more components, but we are talking very, very little. All right, next, I think we can skip this and come to the end. Pros and cons, maintenance issue, trends, are, trends of isolated versus Zena barrier. So basically we're talking about uh, a summary of what we discussed today because we're already into one hour and 10 minutes. So let's close with this one, Bob. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, we've already really talked about this. I think what I would just say is that it used to be historically people would perceive Zener barriers are significantly less expensive than isolated barriers. And, and generally speaking, I think today what you're seeing is that that cost differential between the two is, is certainly shrinking. Um, manufacturers are building more and more isolated barriers. The marketplace is buying less Zener barriers. So just from supply and demand uh, is, is also driving that. Technology is also driving that. Um, but again, I think when people start looking at really kind of the things that we talked about, um, the, the need for that dedicated safety earth, Zener barriers are also a lot more susceptible to damage during startups. So all of those factors, a lot of people are leaning much more towards isolated barriers. Now, to be fair, GMI only manufactures isolated barriers, right? So that is look, correct, Bob. Yeah. And there's one reason for it. There is no market for a new project for Zena Barrier. So there is still quite a big market in terms of uh, volume, but so for existing installation where you have thousands of Zena Barrier and they keep blowing up and therefore you need to replace it. But you know, manufacturer with the X brand in there will only buy X brand to replace it. So right. since we, you know, we, we used to make Zena Barrier tons of years ago and we don't anymore. Although it's a trend, I saw some other, uh, you know, global manufacturer dropping them out also. So, okay, I believe we've been uh, going, you know, quite a bit of time here. Let's see, I, I see a question come up. Many thanks. Well, before we end, I have, uh, <laughs> you guys give me an opportunity let me give one second to give, tell us how we did. Okay, so we are launched this poll. How do we do? And you can answer this question so that maybe me and Bob, you know, can value ourselves. I mean, it's been uh, the second webinar we do together, Bob, right? Third. 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 Huh. We yeah. lost count. Yeah, yeah. No, this yeah. is, uh, we're, we're getting better, I think, hopefully. Yeah, I'm we're not good. sure I am. <laughs> It's but still we, a little bit, you know, I'm still very anxious when I'm talking into this camera, you know, I don't see you guys, but I still feel you're there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. We have a hundred percent. Excellent. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you very much. You look out for our next webinars. Uh, we list them on our website, gminternational.com. Just look on there. If you see one you like, just register. Okay, yeah. Bob, have the rest of the day. Good day. I'm going home. It's evening for me. It's time for some wine. <laughs> okay. All right. Ciao, guys. Ciao to everybody. Ciao, ciao. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.